One of the most important fights in the Roman Civil War was the Battle of Philippi. At this meeting, Octavian and Mark Antony had to work together to face the main people behind the plot to kill Julius Caesar. And that's what this video is going to be about. The young Octavian felt like he was on the top of the world after having won the battles of Forum Gallorum and Mutina. It is not hard to see why. Everything seemed possible to him because he was young, the son of Caesar, and a winner. But his happiness stopped soon after the battle, and it was replaced by a fierce anger. This was because the Roman Senate, which had asked Octavian for help, thought that Brutus had been much more important than Octavian in the battles against Antony. Because of this, they gave Brutus much better rewards, and even considered him giving charge of the consular troops. Octavian was angry and felt that Rome had discredited them. He had a strong reaction by staying in the Po Valley, refusing to help in any new attack against Antony. After this, in July, Octavian sent a group of centurions to Rome. They asked for the consulates left empty by Hirtius and Pansa, and for the order that made Antony a public enemy to be revoked, but they were turned down. He was tired of the Roman high circles and decided to do something about it. He took eight troops and marched through the city. The Republic's army was small, so Octavian didn't have much trouble. Then, after another important win, on August the 19th, 43 BC, he was voted consul, which was the top rank in the Republic. His relative, Quintus Pedius, became co-consul. But power struggles never stopped in Rome. While Octavian was having a party, Mark Antony made a deal with Marcus Aemilius Lepidus another one of Julius Caesar's old allies, which gave him even more power. Octavian knew that this union would be a danger to his power, so he made a strategic choice. He opted to join forces with Antony and Lepidus, who were his worst enemies, so that all of Julius Caesar's supporters and troops would be on the same side, at least for the time being. They set up the Triumvirate, a group of three top figures who worked together to run the country. After everything was settled, Octavian, Antony, and Lepidus met near Bologna in October 43 BC and formed the Second Triumvirate. The Senate gave them their powers on November the 27th. This clear assignment of special authority for five years was then made official by a law passed by the common people. This was different from the First Triumvirate, which was made up of Pompey, Julius Caesar, and Marcus Licinius Crassus without any official backing. The triumvirs then started the proscriptions, which labeled between 130 and 300 senators and 2,000 other officials as thieves, traitors, and enemies of the Republic. This made it possible for all of them to be punished. Also, many of those who fought back were killed right away. It's important to remember that the trio issued this order in part because they needed to raise money for the wages of their troops for the upcoming battle against Marcus Junius Brutus and Gaius Cassius Longinus who killed Caesar. This is supported by the fact that the Romans were more likely to catch the new criminals if they could get money for putting them in jail or killing them. This was good for the triumvirate and the bounty hunters. The rulers could keep the prisoners' goods and property, and those who brought Rome's new enemies to justice made a lot of money. Anyone could kill an outlaw and get a share of his property if he brought his severed head to the authorities. During this dark time in Roman history, some of the outsiders were able to leave the country, but many more died. This time in Rome was so violent that each member of the Second Triumvirate tried to put the blame on the other two. But many people were surprised that the young Octavian wanted to kill so many people he didn't like. Over the years that followed, Octavian got a bad reputation for being too cruel. On January the 1st, 42 BC, after Julius Caesar had died, the Senate made him Divus Iulius, a god of the Roman state. It was the highest honor for the greedy Caesar, who had now had the right to be honored for all time. But Octavian also profited from this. He was able to win the respect and favor of so many important Romans by emphasizing that he was the straight heir of a god and the son of a divine. But after this had happened, it was time to go back to war. Many of the people who killed Caesar were still free and planning to kill Octavian. 
Mark Antony and Octavian sent 23 legions across the sea to fight Brutus and Cassius' armies, which were based in Greece. In October 42 BC, the two forces got close to the Macedonian city of Philippi. The first legion came from the southeast and was led by Brutus and Cassius. Mark Antony and Octavian came from the west, wanting to get back at those who killed Caesar. Everyone wanted to fight. But strangely, the first big problem the troops faced had nothing to do with war. Instead, it was a logistics issue. Brutus and Cassius's men used Neapolis as a supply base. This meant that the people in charge of bringing food to the fight had to cross mountains to get there. At the same time, Octavian and Mark Antony's men were using Amphipolis, which was even further away. This made it hard for them to get things done. Mark Antony tried to get around Philippi by making a bridge across the waters south of the city. Brutus and Cassius were in the best spots, which were two small hills west of Philippi. Had his plan been successful, his enemies wouldn't have been able to communicate with each other. But Cassius found it and built a dam across the river. Mark Antony didn't expect it. But while his opponent was busy, he told his men to attack Cassius' camp. They did very well. And Cassius, thinking that everything had been lost, killed himself before he found out that Brutus had also beaten Octavius' army and taken over the enemy camp. They did very well, and Cassius, thinking that everything had been lost, killed himself before he found out that Brutus had also beaten Octavian's army and taken over the enemy camp. In other words, each side won and lost something. When Cassius died, Brutus was deeply sad claiming that he was the last of the Romans. But he didn't have a public wake since he thought it would hurt the spirit of the army. The early looting and wealth collecting by Brutus's advancing troops gave Octavian's men a chance to fix their line. Over the next three weeks, Antony was able to slowly move his army south of Brutus's troops, securing a hill near Cassius's old camp that Brutus had left unguarded. Making sure he wouldn't be surrounded, Brutus moved his line south and then east, parallel to the Via Ignatia, and built several strong posts. He wanted to stick to the original plan, which was to avoid an open fight and hope that his greater sea power could wear down the enemy. At the same time, he wanted to keep the high ground. It's important to note that this was Brutus's plan from the start. His strategy was to get a good defensive position and then use his naval advantage to stop the triumvirs from communicating with their supply base in Italy. However, he changed his plan. In fact, Brutus had no choice but to fight, because he was in danger of being left alone and out of power if he didn't. If the triumvirs could keep extending their lines to the east without being stopped, they would finally cut off his supply route to Neapolis and pin him against the mountains. If that happened, the situation would change. Brutus would either die of hunger or be forced to withdraw his whole army by taking the dangerous northern trail to Philippi. Since there was no option, it was either all or nothing. But what neither side knew was that the battle would cause many casualties because it was mostly hand-to-hand -hand fighting between two well-trained, experienced forces. For the most part, troops didn't use long-range weapons like darts or javelins. Instead, they stood in lines and fought with their swords. Cassius Dio stated that neither side needed to use weapons like javelins or catapults. Instead, the men went straight into hand-to-hand -hand fighting, trying to break each other's lines. Plutarch wrote that Brutus won the battle at the western end of his line and pushed hard on the left side of the triumvirs. The triumvirs gave way and ran away and the Republican cavalry tried to take advantage of the situation when they saw that the enemy was tangled. But, much to Brutus' dismay, the eastern side of his line had fewer numbers, after having been stretched out to keep from being outflanked. This meant that Brutus' troops had been cut down too much in the middle, making them too weak to stand up to the first attack from the triumvirs. After the triumvirs broke through this enemy position, they turned to the left to attack Brutus from the side and back. The historian, Appianus, says that the triumvir troops pushed back the enemy line as if they were going around a huge big machine. The armies of Brutus were pushed back, and they started to give way more quickly. The second and third backup lines could not keep up with the retreat, so all three gave up. 
Before the beaten army could reach this defensive position, Octavian's men were able to take over the gates of Brutus's camp. His army couldn't get back together, and the triumvirs won the battle. Brutus was able to escape to the nearby hills with only four legions worth of soldiers. He killed himself, knowing that he would have to give up and be captured. After the two major battles at Philippi, Octavian and Antony's men could enjoy the breakthrough win. Mark Antony later used the fact that his forces won both fights to ridicule Octavian. Antony said that Octavian was a coward for giving military power to Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa. He also deemed himself responsible for both wins. Even with all of this, it is still important to say that Antony got most of the credit from the Romans for this victory. Many people saw that, besides being a great military leader, he was also a man of honor and pride due to how he treated the kidnapped aristocrats and the rest of the defeated. Despite their egos and quarreling over who deserved more credit, what was important for both was that they were able to beat their main enemies on the battlefield. And, to help the winners, the rest of Brutus's troops were brought together. And, about 14,000 men joined the army of the Triumvirs. Some of the soldiers went back to their homes in Italy, but others stayed in Philippi, which became a Roman settlement. Antony stayed in the east, but Octavian went back to Italy to look for enough land to settle a lot of soldiers there. Antony's career reached its peak at the Battle of Philippi. At the time, he was the most famous Roman general and the leader of the Second Triumvirate. This meant unwelcome news for Octavian. He thought that, after all the wars and fights he had been in, he was the only person who could lead Rome. After Antony had done so well, his authority was in more danger than ever. Then, slowly and quietly, the Second Triumvirate started to fall apart. This ended the fragile partnership between Antony and Octavian, and led to many more fights between them as they tried to get as much power and fame as possible. But that will be a story for a video to come. If you like this video, please don't forget to like it and subscribe to the channel. See you in the next video.